Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, and today we're joined by the Minnesota Vikings beat writer for The Athletic, Alec Lewis. Alec details his most recent article in The Athletic about building the perfect quarterback, which talks about quarterbacks, biomechanics, the quarterback trainers, and how they develop into the best quarterbacks that we get to watch on Sundays. He also dives into a friend of the S2 Cognition Podcast, Kirk Cousins' recent journey and the Netflix special, and how cognition and player development at the highest level have to be intertwined. You can follow Alec on Twitter at Alec underscore Lewis, and we recommend you do, especially if you're a sicko like we are about all things NFL. To help us continue our growth, we ask that you subscribe, rate, and review our show. We hope you enjoy this interview, which is next here on the S2 Cognition Podcast. Alec, man, thanks so much for joining. Really appreciate you coming on. Excited to have you. Uh, ready to roll, talk through you know, the athletic writer. You just wrote a story about building the perfect quarterback. What inspired it? Yeah, it's a great question. And I guess it, it kind of, first, thanks for having me, guys. But it, it kind of takes me to my the job I had before I started covering the Vikings. Like I covered the Kansas City Royals, um, which is a team that has had a, a, a turbulent um, kind of stretch. And I, I was always fascinated by what are they doing on the development side as a smaller market organization to put themselves in the best situation? And then what are other teams doing? And so it, I, I got so fascinated by pitching development and by the biomechanics space um, and the cognitive side and these, these minor, I think, edges that the teams at the very forefront were maximizing to help players become better. And so this offseason, as I was thinking about quarterbacks, I was like, I, I, it hit me. I was like, is, is biomechanics a part of a part of quarterback development? And then I read some stuff and figured out it was. And then I read some more and I, and I started to kind of ask questions of like, who is doing this at the optimal level within the space? And you get a bunch of names thrown out and you, it, it, it's so fascinating. But I. I knew I, I started to read about Tom Gormley's background and Tom had worked with baseball players prior to working with quarterbacks. And we hopped on the phone and he was using words like ecological dynamics. Um, and one thing kind of turned to another and it, it, it just led me down a rabbit hole where I talked to a ton of quarterbacks about their arcs of, of how they were developed years ago versus how they're being developed and, and maximizing themselves now. And so, um, yeah, I, I had to convince my editors that I could use kind of this baseball side to, to, to apply to quarterback, to the quarterback space. But I was, I mean, really overall, my, the thesis of it for me was like, this is the most important position in sports. And for so long, like, I'm not sure if anybody knew how to develop it optimally. And I think we're getting, I wouldn't say we're probably there, but I think we're closer than ever to maximizing that development. And that to me was so, was so fun to think about and so crazy. And, um, and so it was, it was a very cool opportunity that I'm glad my editors allowed me to, to go do. There was one piece in it that was hilarious to me. Uh, you talk about like med ball, like the weighted ball throw. So I played uh, college baseball and that became this, like the first two or three years, this is 2011, 2012, 2013. We never did it. <laughs> and then about my junior senior year, like, we this this new evolution of like, hey, pitchers need to take care of their arms. They're going to do these weighted ball throws into these mats on the dugout. And it's like, wait, what is it? Why are we doing? But like, arm your arm feels so much better. You long toss for like the the care of the arm went way up, and injuries to our arm went way down. And you were like, wait, what is this? And then now all of a sudden, I'm reading a story. It's like, yeah, quarterbacks are starting this. I'm like, they're starting to do this. <laughs> this their arm is the most important. So it was like this blown away. I guess, realization of just myself of, wow, the most important position and probably the most important sport and the most important part of their body, they're not even taking care of like what pitchers have been doing for years. And it's essentially the same thing. And that's what, I mean, I think really struck me is <laughs> like, again, I know the amount of money involved with this. I know the, the, super, the branding of the quarterback. And then to hear that like having spent time in baseball like I did, that that football and quarterbacking was behind baseball. I was like, how's that even possible with how much this society in America cares about this game? And it's funny, like the the weighted ball stuff, um, 
it was it was such a hot topic in baseball and like polarizing, I think, from the old school method. And I just had this image in my head, and I don't know how much I should say this, and I'm not trying to get mad or, or, or get anybody in trouble, but I remember I visited um, the, the Royals double-A team, Northwest Arkansas, and I drove down there, and I was in Springdale, and I remember I sat there like hours before a game and watched the Mariners double-A team and the Royals double-A team warm up. And on the Royals side, it was just we're tossing, throwing catch like I did when I was a kid, and that, that was great. On the Mariners side, they're slinging these med balls around. They're throwing footballs. They're slinging stuff against the wall. And it looks so odd. But I think the more – and I was I was so fascinated. Like, why are they doing this? And the more you hear about the why um, and kind of dig into the science behind it, the more fascinated it becomes. And so I think just that image and, and those types of, like, experiences that I had just resonated with me and probably forever will. And, like, I, my dad says all the time, like, why do you – he's always like, why do you feel like you want to find the answer? And I'm like – Dad, I don't know. I, I sucked as a player. I don't know, but I just, I'm always, um, I always think like there's such an edge in development and player development. And so I think that's kind of what drew me to it. And it, and it is fascinating to see that quarterbacks are just now starting to utilize some of these things. Yeah. I like, you know, we talk a lot, uh, internally just about just every single sport, how they've advanced in the last 10 years, probably in most major sports has just significantly changed. Um, what have you seen over your time in football? I think this opportunity for you to really dig into the quarterback, where do you find the football space making the most grounds from, you know, whether it be technology or just what they're doing internally, right? I mean, we see it at the college level a lot, just with like these advanced strength and conditioning coaches that have been doing different mechanic stuff. I mean, where do you see pro football now and in, a, in directions they're heading? Yeah, I would say it's still kind of on the surface of starting to trend the way that, that some of these other sports, and I think to your point, even college sports has trended. Like obviously my mind and, and it goes straight to Jack Marucci and some of the forward thinking nature of those guys at LSU. Um, and I think you've seen a little bit of a trickle up from some staffers there and staffers elsewhere kind of finding themselves within the NFL space. But I mean, I thought it was so interesting di diving into this. Like there were some teams and, and I'll, I'll throw out the Philadelphia Eagles that were really fascinated with what was possible, um, from a, from a movement perspective, from a, a, I mean, I think they were very willing to, to ask the questions of like, why do we coach what we coach? And is there a way we can coach better? And I think um, they're probably one of very few in the NFL that are kind of at that point. And so I do think though, I mean, I, I, I go back to a conversation I had with Austin Jurgers who, who works for the Royals, but he said one time, like it takes one to adapt. It takes two, it takes three, and then you have 15 and then it's everybody's else. Everybody else is, is catching on. And then the, the first two are trying to, to gain, themselves to another level. And so I kind of think from a biomechanics space, uh, specific speaking biomechanics specifically and movement patterning, I think every team is going to probably catch on these next few years. I do think, and this is pretty uh, relevant for you guys, the cognitive side of it, um, like I was having a, a conversation with a Viking staffer the other day and he said to me, he's like, I still think, especially with quarterback, like being able to coach um, certain field vision, that type of stuff. He's like, that is, that is the untapped area that I don't think, um, a lot of teams have answers for. And that's where I think that's why I've been so fascinated by this space because it is like you, you watch the film of a quarterback and you, you, and so their arm looks good, but then sometimes they make these plays. You're like, how, why, what did they not see? What did they miss? And I think, um, like the more you have conversation with, with the dub Maddoxes of the industry and others, like, this is the space um, from a thinking versus and, and cognitive and processing that the better I think people understand not only how to quantify it, but then how to take that information and be able to help coach a guy and, and, and develop a guy from that. I think that is um, something that, that is still remains very untapped and that the more we trend toward figuring it out, I think the space is going to be better off for it. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point because I think, as you pointed out, it takes a little bit of figuring out and everybody getting on board. And sometimes those those waters are muddy, right? And I think one of the things that the traps that we fall into a lot of times is that 
we try to assume a quarterback's decision-making skills based on the outcome of a play. Um, and that's not always, that doesn't tell you, it only tells you half of the story, what you've seen. Right. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, how you want to look at it, I got drug into this San Francisco 49ers world, right. With the Brock, with the Brock Purdy and Trey Lance thing. And, you know, Hey, look at this decision, how bad of a decision it was. And it's like, okay, well, if you knew the Shanahan offense and how you have to make decisions in that offense and what the receiver's responsibilities are, it's just not always that crystal clear. Right. So I'm glad. Yeah. Not to cut you off, but I'm glad you bring that up because um, just a great example is the Vikings played a preseason game against the Seahawks. And like, I don't know how many people are paying attention, but because I'm insane, I not only paid attention that night. To Alec, we're sickos. <laughs> yeah, First of all, it was a catch by yeah. Jordan and <laughs> we're sickos. OK, keep going. It was 100 percent a catch. But here's the real sicko part. So the next day and all the writers were all the writers were trolling me about this, but I went through the, the all 22 coaches film for like three hours and I was tweeting clips and some of the other writers are like, uh, buddy, it's the first preseason game. But I, I rewatched every Jaron Hall play. Jaron Hall is a back, a third string quarterback, the Vikings draft. And the reason I bring him up is I watched one specific play and then I brought it to a coach afterward and I asked him about it. And he's like, well, what you don't understand is we actually had the wrong play call. They, the, the receivers aligned wrongly. So he was trying to sort that through on the fly, and it's still they were still aligned wrongly after the snap and ran the wrong routes. And so, like, you might think it's a bad decision on the quarterback, but you have no idea any of that context. And so it's exactly well, to your Alec, point. Yeah. E- even to the Super Bowl, you, we, we got the mic'd up version of Patrick Mahomes looking over and saying, he's lined up wrong. And they still scored a touchdown. On, right. the same, on that exact play to the other side, he was aligned wrong, and they still were able to make it work. But to the public in the moment, we have no idea. You have no idea. And, and, and I think that's like if I've learned anything, and I remember um, – and like I don't know why I'm saying this, but I remember like my mom asked me maybe three weeks into my job with the Viking covering the Vikings. She had, and she's not a big sport. She's like, what have you – like what's the biggest thing? I'm like, mom, the, the – um, the the smoothness which with which with these teams operate and choreograph their play calls and, and the ways that it worked like I I don't think I understood just the level of detail that that goes into some of these plays and it's it, it is it's something that I've been very impressed by but it's something again um, like I never would say to a fan like don't react strongly but I think often it's like the fan just doesn't and, and the and the fan fan just wants to enjoy the game, root on their team. So I totally get it. But sometimes there is so much more context to like run the football. Well like if the three technique is in a certain spot, then they're probably not going to run that direction. So it's it's stop um, using reasoning, Alec. Please <laughs> yeah. stop using reasoning. And, and and that's like my brain, which is which is kind of insane. But I think granted to, to your point in general, like that is what that's what complicates um, trying to really evaluate these things because there's just so many layers of it. Where, and I always compare it to baseball. It's like baseball, you have the pitch profile and you have the hitter's swing decision and certain angles within within those two realms. But most most of the time, it's just a couple variables, whereas football, everybody has a different role. And a, a, a lot of times, you don't know what everybody's role is. So, um, yeah, you got me on my on my uh, train there. But it, it's it's that that's a part of it that has been very interesting for me to kind of notice in a set a friend of the podcast kurt cousins you had to push this recording a day because mr important which which he is one of the few we're okay with you pushing to record to go listen to his introduction so anyways how does he look would you say different from last offseason to this offseason what are the differences you're seeing in his decision making his playing his throwing comfort like he looks like he's free he's having fun he's goofing around um, and talking to people close to him, I think like when he is in that element where he can be his goofy self, where he knows he's being goofy, and he knows he's he's whatever nerd swag. I think is the word. Like he knows he he he, the gr- he makes the fun of him. Yeah, and he knows it's a goofy thing. But he, I think, when he feels that way, you can you can like feel his comfort. And I think it's obviously you're two in a system for him. That and I know when he was on with you guys, he talked about like the challenges of having to learn new systems and how that affected his development early on. And I thought that, I thought that was really fascinating, but I think his comfort is not only just the vibes and the culture within the team, um, but also just like 
his comfort within the system and feeling like they can take another step. I mean, he hasn't had the same coordinator in offense, I think, going back to Sean McVay with Washington. So um, I've enjoyed just kind of hearing his openness. And I think it goes back to, to, I mean, what a lot of people saw in the Netflix documentary, but this guy really cares about his job. And I think he, he, he's still out to gain any minor edge that you guys know better than anybody. The Netflix thing actually dovetails right with what your point was, right? I think after it was like game one or game two, he acknowledged it's just so hard. I've never had to do this before. Like I know the look, I know what's expected, but I've never been in a coordinator system where this is the read. Um, and so you could tell he was kind of obviously he had a phenomenal season last year. Um, but I would imagine it's only going to get better with his comfort in that system. What did you think of the Netflix documentary? Yeah. What, I, what's I your take it. on it? No, I loved it. I I mean, I thought it, the craziest part was I didn't even know that was happening during the season. Like we didn't see any crazy cameras. And I will tell you, talking to Kirk, he was very intentional in not wanting it, other players and, and media and everybody to think like, this is his show. This is his, like, he was very intentional in not wanting that stuff around because he just wanted to, to operate nor, as normal with the team. But I, I mean, I thought it was great. I thought um, he, and again, I say this and I'm very empathetic and probably overly sympathetic sometimes to these guys as human beings, but like, he's just a very, like a human who, who navigates, I think pressures, doubts, um, like outside perspective noise in a way that I think a lot of us do at times. And, and, and I think he cares about it so much. And I think that came, that came through, through the documentary. It was cool to, to hear from his wife. I mean, I thought it was like, and again, this is where I probably should be careful, but it's like, I thought I, I heard narrative. It's like, Oh, he takes Tuesday off, man. But I was like, if you know this guy, and you know how much he cares and puts in, like he needs to take Tuesday off for like his just balance. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it shined through that this guy will seek out anything he can um, to become a better quarterback. And, and I think that is admirable, especially when you think about his background. Like this guy was overlooked in, in high school and college early on in the NFL. I mean, he's had to prove it time and time again. I can't imagine what that would do to your psyche if you're, you're never told, like, you're the guy, Kurt. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it was – I loved it. And, I, and I, I thought it was really good that people got to see that, that level of detail. That was my, one of my biggest takeaways, too. It was like, I don't know that there's another player, specifically that position, that squeezes more out of their opportunity than what you got to see him do. And it was incredibly impressive. For the public to now understand, like, look, chiropractic work, food work, all, all, all at hydro, you know, going in for mental processing. And then he's talking to, you know, your team, uh, team clinician to talk through. It's like he is spending every waking hour, except Tuesday, in working on trying to get uh, and maximize his potential. He's Alec Lewis. That's on Twitter at Alec underscore Lewis. Um, I, I really appreciate your ability to dovetail that Netflix series. Was there, was there anything else that stood out that you, you, uh, that maybe we didn't get to see? Um, you mean from the season in general or the, or the Netflix specifically? I mean, I, Could be I both. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. Like I think Kirk was very open about like for the first eight weeks of the season, it just wasn't fluid. And he would say they would win and he would be like, like, this doesn't feel like I'm playing very well. And he's very open about that and very honest about it. But I also thought, and this probably speaks to, to a little bit like the, I mean, we can get into it a little bit like the test he took with you guys, but I thought he was, he was willing to be more creative. I think he's always, like I said, balance earlier, but he's always trying to find that balance of, like be who you are and, and, and play from the pocket. And that's his strength, but also try to, again, improve, develop. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a tough part of probably playing the position for as long as he has is like, how do I become more, um, I don't know, like off schedule? How do I be more kind of artistic yes. with it when? When like what has gotten me to this point is being so studious and knowing where I need to go with the ball. And I think like when guys are flying at you and, and, and the pressures of the night game on Thanksgiving or like, I mean, that's a hard thing to probably try to navigate in real time. But I think he was mindful enough to, to, 
to attempt to do that. And I think Kevin O'Connell, his head coach, I think pushed him to, to kind of um, embrace that, that side of himself that I think as you guys even talked about, like he's probably – and, and he realized that he's probably better at than maybe he even understood. Yeah, I think it, it dovetails with what you were saying earlier. And I think that we forget about that psychological aspect. And these guys are just human. And, you know, I, I forget exactly specifically what subtest it was on our evaluation. It might have been improvisation or instinctive learning. But he was just kind of like, man, you know, I've always had that feeling about myself, but I've just never trusted it. Um, probably because he's been told you're not a creative dude, stick to the script, Kirk, you know, and, and he's like, man, I really am good at it. You know, I'm going to trust a little bit more of that. And again, we would never said, you know, we're the Holy grail or we can pick apart a player, but even just a small nugget like that, like, okay, I am good at that. I can trust this aspect of my game and sort of lean into it in difficult moments when the bullets are flying and chaos is around me. I can kind of lean into that. Um, and so it's good to see him. You know, I think I was really pleased that he showed that human side because I think he gets a bad rap for the reasons of this sort of nerd swagger. But I mean, he's a human being trying to be the best quarterback he can be. And it was just, it was really refreshing on our end to see the Vikings do so well last year. I mean, it did, maybe didn't end up where everybody wanted it to, but I can guarantee you those are the expectations of fans as the season grows. When that season started, you were not expecting to go, you know, where you went. So I think it, it's just a, you know, great organizational sort of swing there. Yeah, and I, I think what you said about, like, the narratives around him, I mean, that was part of, like, you asked what more stood out from last year, and that was something like, okay, I'm 26 years old. I came in, I'm a big football fan, I played fantasy, I know what people say about X player, and I, I knew like the narrative on Kirk, like I, whatever, you have your own biases that you bring to the job. And then I watched him every day and I'm like, and then I learned his backstory a little bit and you're like, wow, okay, so this guy was not recruited at all, he was brought in and on the scout team where they went live on him and just hammered him at Michigan State over and over and over. He battled that, he won the job. He, he got drafted in the same class by the same team that drafted a guy who they, they want, the ownership wanted. And then you just like, but he still continued to progress. And now here he is. And you can, you can argue about what, what his ranking is as a quarterback in the league. But like, I feel like, man, this guy has, has, has squeezed everything out of the orange. And he has said, like, he can't sit with himself if he, if he knows he, there's more for him to untap. And again, that's where it's like, man, that's where I think the torment of, of his pursuit kind of can get to him. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's been it, like, he's been a fascinating athlete to cover. And as you can probably hear it in my voice, like, I've done a lot of work on the subject. There will be some more in the next few weeks that I'm looking forward for people to reading. Um, but yeah, I, I just, it's, it's been a very fun, uh, like this is why you do the job type thing for me of like to get to learn a little bit more more about what a guy a human being kind of goes through especially at that level um in in sport well brandon i think what touches on this right he you know alex said it allowed him to play more free he expressed that to us when you hear that as a co-founder of a company that's trying to help player development and 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 athletes maximize their potential how does that make you feel of something that you hear a guy who's literally maximizing or trying to maximize everything when he tells you man this has helped me allow myself to be more free how, how do you take that yeah i mean that that is that's the foundation of what scott and i tried to start here right i think you know as alec knows we've had plenty of discussions about this we've gotten drug into the scouting space like we, we didn't set out to be a scouting company we got set up to 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 understand how athletes are wired so that we can maximize their strengths and build programs around their weaknesses. Um, and that's what we were doing at LSU for years before, you know, before the NFL sort of pulled us. And so for a guy who is clearly NFL, you know, uh, I mean, I consider him a top tier NFL quarterback. I would take him for my team 
over, you know, for half the teams in the league, I would want Kirk Cousins over what the alternatives are. And so to hear, hear a guy at that level suggest that we've helped his career in any way, shape or form, it could be, you know, just a minuscule amount. I mean, mission accomplished. I mean, that's what we set out to do. I'll say this too, like, and you touched on this earlier, but I think like for an athlete psychologically, when they've been told something over and over to have some kind of objective measure of like, no man, like this is a strength of yours. This is something you excel at, or even like, this is not a strength of yours. So you lean into this or work. Like, I think that is such an advantage in whatever capacity, because like, I think all these guys battle confidence and, and, and wanting to like have an idea of their strengths. And I think about like pitchers, like some guys were told, like, look, dude, your fastball's characteristics, like the stuff plus in your fastball, if you just throw it down the middle, it's going to be a success. And the guy's like, really? What? But then you start to trust that and it can change the course of guys' careers. And so I think um, that is like, I mean, you talk about us too. And I, I mean, it's just been, it's been so interesting because I started to learn about it in 2019, long before it was a, a thing within the draft cycle or whatever. And I remember talking to Royals coaches that I will say now we're like, man, this is, this has really helped us be able to evaluate a guy, um, develop certain hitters, have an understanding of why a guy's succeeding when maybe he was a 10th round uh, pick from old dominion. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I, I, I think that part of it, like the, the ability for coaches and just, just the athlete themselves to have like an objective measure of like, maybe just another objective measure. It might not be the, the the holy grail but of like this is maybe where i excel in a way that i didn't i didn't think like i think that is a a really cool thing that um that's it's why i've been fascinated by since 2019 when the royals started to talk about it privately yeah and that's the thing is understanding i mean you went to this earlier i think when you're asking questions of how why what when a play is made, I think one of the beautiful things about the evaluation is helping you understand that why, right? So the result, let's look at baseball, right? Since we're on this baseball train, the why is, well, he, the result is he swings and misses at a certain pitch, but you don't know the why. And the why could be for a myriad of different reasons, non-mechanical, right? So you got mechanical problems, but from a swing decision standpoint, a really, really, really uh, intelligent baseball mind once told me major leaguers don't get out because of their mechanics. They get out because they're swing decisions. And so if you're trying to understand why a player is swinging, if we can isolate and see and then individually train that area, because, you know, if it's a why, you know, you're throwing into different uh, training drills to understand, okay, if I, if I suck at hitting a changeup, but I'm just going to go um, do this drill for change up uh, pitch recognition or fine. If we can isolate those things and put these different players, right? So their results are going to go up that they're not swinging and missing at those change ups, but they're doing different drill work based on their profile. I think that's the beautiful thing. Yeah. No. And I, I think um, like that's where when I, when I mentioned, uh, <laughs> I told this to you, Brandon, but I wrote that story and it was so much, uh, like the mechanical side of things. It was so much biomechanics and kind of throwing motion and, and movement patterning. But I told you and I, I told guys like Dub Maddox and others, I was like, there is a whole different story that might even be more important, could be that uh, about the cognitive side and developing that level of the game that um, hopefully no one listens to this and steals that idea because I really want to make it happen at some point. Um, the but yeah, pro think, uh, property of the athletic, right? Is that yeah, what you're saying? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, um, yeah. Uh, but I, but I, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I think, and, and that's where I think part of, and maybe this is just the youth to me, but I think for so long it's like there are these these ideas about this is how you develop, this is how you train, this is what we have to do because this is what we were taught, and I think. What we've got, we've gotten to a place in, in golf specifically and in baseball. And I think now we're getting there in football and in a very kind of, uh, we're, we're just probably crack, touching the surface here um, of like, no, let's ask why we do what we do, why we coach what we coach and how we can maybe be better. And I think it will be a benefit to, to players probably at all levels, which is, I know you guys, it's what you guys want. And like, for me, like, yeah, I, I love watching good athletes. So if I can watch better athletes, I'm, I'm, I, I'll take it any day of the week. 
I say, Alec, we've always uh, loved, I've personally loved your writing because you're always upbeat and optimistic. And I think, I think we need more of that in the media because everything is, you know, oftentimes such a downer. So always being positive, we've really appreciated it. We're, we are so interested in what's next. What's next from the Alec, Alec Lewis archives? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should talk to Jack Marucci. He'll, he'll talk to me about Eye tracking technology. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And like I, we, before we got on, I was talking about the, the busy nature of this job and it, it does. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot. And, um, but like I say it all the time. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. It's like the fact that I get to do this at this level is something I am so grateful for and always will be because it was kind of the dream. And, and I think like, I, I, like you, you can hear it probably, but I just love trying to figure out what's next, trying to learn. Um, and if I'm not, then I think I'm just, I don't know, I'm probably not doing it the best way. So I'll, I will bother you, Brandon, uh, probably you, Hunt Harrison, probably every athlete who I come across too much. Um, but that's, that's, that's why I do what I do. So it's fun. And we appreciate it, right? You can follow him on Twitter at Alec underscore Lewis. We're going to dive into the really important piece of our podcast. And those are the three famous random or funny questions that may or may not have anything to do with your life. You ready? Yeah. I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know I was going to get a lightning round. This is good. Oh, this is, this is the lightning round that everyone skips out on once we end. Okay. So the funniest or most entertaining player that you've gotten to cover, uh, baseball, football. <sighs> Zach Greinke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Zach, Zach Greinke, um, in Kansas city was awesome. And I wish I had more conversations with them. We one time I stopped him at the dugout and I didn't know what he was going to say. I, I mean, you just didn't know. And, uh, I remember he's like, he's like, but he knew he's like, so you write for, you write for the same website as that Eno Saris guy, right? I was like, yep, the athletic. Yep. He's like, I like that guy. He's a top five writer in my opinion. Um, so Zach, Zach, he, there are some stories, um, like he would go, like it would be the morning and I would like be looking for him to try to talk him about pitching. Cause he could talk about pitching forever. And he was like in the crown club, just like sitting in there by himself. I don't know. That's like the, the like buffet thing. I don't really know why he was in there, but yeah, Zach, Zach is a unique and I don't use that word often um, guy, but I think his intentions, like for all of the stories, whatever, like he, he's, I think he's a really good dude. Um, Wait, the who, cat like, really, story. <laughs> the cat story. Okay, so this became public. Can you, for the audience, will you tell the cat story? Yeah, we did. Jason Jinx, who's for, who's a, a Royals, uh, he likes the Royals, and we did a couple oral histories. And I part of some of those oral histories go, but yeah, I think Nicky Lopez, who was the second baseman with the Royals, um, I think Zach asked him uh, something of the sort of like, like, do you like cats or something? And Zach was like, I don't trust anybody with cats. And then something, Nikki was like, do you like dogs? And I think Zach's like, no, I've got two cats or something like that. Uh, <laughs> so Zach, Zach, yeah, Zach. I mean, like, I remember Whit Merrifield told me a story where, like, he just, like, walked down to the Four Seasons lobby one day, like, with, like, just without shoes. Like, he's just barefoot in the lobby. Like, like what is going on? Um, but I think, I think, like, but one thing about Zach, I will say, is like he had his kids out there every day. And he really cared about like his kids being a part of the experience, and I think that's why he still plays. And uh, and and the teammates loved him, and like he was helpful. So um, for as goofy and as intriguing and and um, just truly unique as he is, like um, a guy I wish I spent more time with uh, for sure. Who is the coach that's given you the most access? Whether you can talk about that publicly or privately. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it publicly. And if they get mad at me, then that's okay. Um, but I, I mean, a guy, Alex Zumwalt, first, he's got a really good first name. Uh, second, he is <laughs> currently, uh, the hitting coach, uh, with the Royals. And I remember in 2019, this is my first year coming to the team. They decided to really revamp their entire hitting development process. And I was out in October in Surprise, Arizona at the facility. And they let me just hang around and watch it. And they were talking about a lot of the stuff that we, we've talked about over the course of the podcast in terms of swing decisions, in terms of maximize, maximizing hard hit rates. And, and, uh, and he just let me watch and he knows this, but like I was, and I think some of the other people at the Royals are like, why are you giving this guy this, this level? But it, it was, it was really educational. 
And I and I I'll say this too, like when you're in this business, I think it can become such a like team versus media and like this like um it, it, you kind of butt heads a little bit. I think the, the the people that I've come across that are willing to explain things to you and not give you everything, but explain and help you learn and answer questions, like it helps them. I think it helps the media. I think it I think it helps the the fan base who wants to know more about the game and the people. And so Alex Zumwalt was very much um, that for me in Kansas City, and there were others there. So I I kind of hate to single them out, but um, I'll say with the Vikings, like. Kevin O'Connell, the head coach, like, well, Anthony, I mean, he'll, ask, if I have a question about gap schemes, he'll, he'll, he'll use the two safety high. I mean, this guy, he's good. Um, but he'll be helpful. So, um, yeah, there, there are, I think a lot, I've, I've been fortunate in that I've come across a lot of people who are willing to help learn. And I think that's a cool, like, probably distinct quality of a lot of those people. We know you're a pretty humble guy. Uh, but are, is there one story that you sit back and you're like, I wrote that? Yeah, that's my best story. Um, the next one. Uh, no, I, oh. I, uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. That, that's like, that's how I feel sometimes, or it's like you finish a story you're really proud of, but it like doesn't, it's like, okay, and what's the next, um, big one? So that's a look into my head, which is probably the unhealthy part of my brain. Um, man, I did a story, uh, in 2020. 2020, I think, on a guy, Brady McConnell, who had been through a lot personally. Um, and I, I, I say this story like I don't if I went back and read it, I have no idea if I structured it well or thinks or, or, or used the right scenes. Like when I write, I think a lot deeply about it. But I just think the being able to be so like human with somebody and talk to them. And we talked on the phone, Brady and I did for hours and hours and hours and talked to his, his dad for a long time, people close to him. And I think like it was a pretty heavy subject. And I think it pushed me to be very vulnerable, be empathetic. I mean, I, I've navigated anxieties and, and, and obsessive character like qualities. And I thought for me, it was like, one of the times probably in this career where like I've been pretty open with him about myself and he kind of poured it into me. And so I, I, that is kind of, that's one that sticks in my mind for sure. Um, just because of the vulnerability of it. Like I, I say all the time and I don't know what my editors will think of this, but like the, the daily observations at camp, the roster projections, the, uh, risers and fallers at camp, like you, I didn't get into this so much for that. I got into it for the story about the, people um and kind of what they have to navigate and so those are the stories that i think stick with me and and the ones that i try to pursue kind of um and will will always as long as i get to do this and i'm fortunate enough so yeah i hope that answers but the next one yeah all right he's uh alec lewis the covers of minnesota vikings for the athletic follow him on twitter at alec underscore lewis man thanks thanks for joining us uh enjoy the season hope to have you on soon again but if not I'm sure we'll hear from you soon. <laughs> yeah, no, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it, Alec. Thank, yeah, of course, Brent. I, I, you know how much I've enjoyed getting to know um, you guys and what you guys have done. So I don't take it for granted at all that, that you guys have been as open as you have. So I appreciate you guys having me. Enjoy. You guys enjoy the season. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Uh, so uh, it. It'll be a absolutely. Good one. Thanks for listening to the S2 Cognition Podcast. Alec was awesome and provided fantastic nuggets about cognition and how players are maximizing the player development space to their full abilities. You can follow him on Twitter at Alec underscore Lewis. He is Alec Lewis of The Athletic, covering the Minnesota Vikings. If you like the content we are putting out, please subscribe with that plus sign at the top of your app, leave a review about the episode, and share it with a friend. You can follow us on Twitter at S2Cognition and Instagram at S2.Cognition. If you'd like to get in touch with the program, please visit our website at S2Cognition.com slash podcast. Again, thanks for listening to the S2 Cognition podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter, signing off for now. Talk to you on our next episode. Thank you.